a lot of folks are interested in stores of value. They are fearful of what could happen and considering investments like gold or cryptocurrency. And I wanted you to explain one of your recent tweets. This is just from the last few days. And it is crypto stable coins dash choose between blow up risk, censorship risk, and fraud risk. What are crypto stable coins and what does this tweet mean? Yeah, just backing up for a second, like I, I think cryptocurrencies are probably one of the greatest inventions uh, in human history. And the reason why they're interesting is because if you look at the technology industry, technology plays in unregulated spaces. It's very hard for technology to change regulated spaces as Uber and Postmates and companies like that find out. Um, but generally, the reason technology works is because it creates its own frontier. It is a digital frontier that is being created. Now the physical frontiers are all closed and the new world has been colonized and the Wild West has been tamed. Where do you go to create new things free of interference and regulation and kind of exercise maximum creativity? And so that's been done mostly in the technology space. And one of the areas that has been protected by technological innovation from technological innovation is Wall Street because they're, it's, you know, they have regulatory capture, very bureaucratic, you know, the, the money industrial complex that runs a lot of our economy and runs a lot of Washington, D.C., where 20% of our GDP goes into financial engineering and into the Wall Street casino. And so cryptocurrencies are kind of how we get around that. And so they're sovereign resistant. They're designed to be completely decentralized. You don't need the violent power of the state to enforce the value of a cryptocurrency. And it allows for truly trustless transactions between humans without some king or authority or government uh, or corporation having to be in the middle. And so it's very liberating to disconnect wealth creation, wealth storage, and wealth protection from the state. And that's what cryptocurrencies really enable. One second, let me just pause to say that at, at one point, you and I did a very thorough cryptocurrency 101 conversation with a domain super expert named Nick Zabo, S-Z-A-B-O, which people can also find for more on kind of the the, the history and basics of, of some of the crypto. Yeah, Nick is a bona fide genius and a pioneer in the space. He also has a great blog called Unenumerated that I highly recommend. But anyway, so the, the best known cryptocurrency is Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is trying to be the new gold or the new Swiss bank account kind of all rolled into one. And it has some advantages, you know, as a store of value. It can be stored digitally, so it's hard to seize. It's very easy to verify, technologically speaking. Unlike gold, it's easy to send across national boundaries and, and electronically over the internet. It's easy divisible and verifiable down to its authenticity is very verifiable where gold is hard to do. It can be divided down to millions and trillions of a Bitcoin very, very easily. It is somewhat programmable. So you can put it inside smart contracts and you can do some intelligent things with it. So it has a lot going for the store of value. What's difficult about it is it's not really private. It doesn't, although there are parts of it that are private, it's not completely private and it's untrusted. It's brand new as far as stores of value go. It's only from 2009. And so people don't know if it'll be around forever and how dependent it is on the internet. And people aren't really certain about some, like the proof of work mining algorithm that makes it possible. And can it be hijacked? Can it be centralized? Can it have a bug? Can it break? And every year that Bitcoin survives and goes through one of the various challenges facing it, it gets more valuable as people entrust it a little bit more and more. But it is extremely volatile. You buy Bitcoin, you're buying a very speculative asset at the moment. And you're speculating that it will become digital gold or possibly even, you know, all store of value and so be incredibly valuable but along the way there's lots of hiccups and at any point it could break it could go to zero and so a lot of people who are now participating in the crypto world, they're building a decentralized Wall Street. They call it DeFi, D-E-F-I for decentralized finance. But I actually think it's more like DeFi as in just defy the government, D-E-F-Y. And so I think we're seeing... <laughs> yeah, we're, Governments love that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're seeing a whole new casino that's better than Wall Street spring, spring up in decentralized finance. Unlike Wall Street, this one is 24-7 open. It's 365 days a year. It's available around the world to everybody. It's trustless in that it's, you know, there's math and algorithms and code underneath that, not Goldman Sachs front running your trades or whatever. Um, not that I'm saying they do, but you know, there's flash boys and kind of all 
all that kind of uh, craziness that goes on. And you can program it to do things and to make bets or hedges or uh, calls that you just can't even do on Wall Street. So I think we're building a better Wall Street using cryptocurrencies. But everyone who participates in that doesn't necessarily want to take on the volatility of these cryptocurrencies. So we've created these things called stable coins, which track the value of the US dollar. So that when you're trading, for example, you can still do it in dollar denominated terms. And this is the tricky thing because the moment you're now trying to track some asset in the real world like dollars then you have to basically peg the value somehow to something that exists in the real world and cryptocurrencies do best when everything is on the blockchain when everything's electronic and digital and controlled by computers in the cloud so these stable coins have come along that mimic the value of the us dollar and the best known ones are tether um usdc which is coinbase's coin and uh uh, and uh, uh, make or die, which is an algorithmically stable coin. But there's no now, free lunch in life. Pause for one second. Well, yeah. is this, should people think of what would be a comparable that people might be more familiar with? It's not an index. It's like an ETF. Or how would you think about, is there another? These are uh, digital dollars. These are designed so that you can live in crypto land. This is living on a blockchain. It's math-based code. But really, your value is pegged to dollars. So it's not going up or down with Bitcoin. It's just it's just worth a dollar all the time. So if you want to hold a dollar in crypto land, the way you do it is by buying one of these so-called stable coins. But all my tweet was observing is that there's no free lunch. The, what you're actually doing underneath is you have crypto and crypto is incredibly volatile and you're trying to convert a volatile asset into a stable asset. So there has to be a cost for that. What is that cost? Well, it's like the subprime mortgage crisis, exactly. right? <laughs> exactly, there's no free lunch. So what is that cost? And all I was saying is that the three main categories of stable coins today, they each impose one or more of these costs. And so one cause is fraud risk where People suspect this of Tether, where like actually this thing says it's backed by dollars, but it's not actually backed by dollars. I don't know if this company has dollars underneath. So you have to kind of take their word for it. So now you're trusting. Underneath meaning they would have actual physical dollars, much Correct. like you would have physical gold. Correct. Yeah. So for every Tether they issue you, they claim to have a dollar somewhere, but what if they don't? And you just don't know. So you're trusting them and there could be fraud underneath. I'm not saying there is. I have no evidence, but that you're basically now back to the trusted third party model that exists in just putting your money in the bank. The second kind is where you're dealing with someone like Coinbase or some company that is well known and trusted and is regulated. But then it's no different than holding normal dollars. There's censorship risk where if the government says, hey, we don't like this character, seize their bank account, Coinbase can turn off your USDC account and your stable coin has basically been seized. You're no longer decentralized and sovereign like you are with Bitcoin. And the last kind of risk is uh, a blow up risk. So something like a maker, you know, it's collateralized, but it's collateralized with Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so what they're hoping is that the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum won't move so drastically that the peg breaks and you lose money on your so-called stable coin. It's just, it's just an observation. There's no free lunch. And so if you're trying to create this, this mythical stable currency out of thin air in what is inherently a very volatile space, you have to pay for it. And people think today they're not paying for it. They're just getting these uh, free crypto stable dollars or they're getting the stability aspect for free, but they're not. They're either taking on fraud risk or censorship risk or blow up risk or some combination of them. So if you're advising, and this is not financial advice, this is just two friends talking, obviously, for informational purposes only. But if if you're talking to a friend who has a fair amount of savings or investable capital, and they say, Naval, I want to do something with crypto, how can I get started? Or how should I get started? What do you say to them? Because there, there's such a broad spectrum of options. It's still, even though it's been simplified a lot, crypto is still quite confusing to it's to very complicated people, so, yeah to people who are who are who are very smart i would consider it's still quite confusing incredibly confusing yeah it's it's a domain of mathematicians hackers you know tech entrepreneurs and and um a few people who really dig in but it's still too hard to handle manage it's dangerous like i can't hold my own crypto i have to stick it inside funds and custodians because i'm a known public figure and it's a bearer asset so ironically i can't actually say bear. it's dangerous you don't hold it because you would be 
that'd be that risk. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a bearer asset. So, you know, you don't want to bear a bearer asset. You have to put it inside vaults, you know, the equivalent of the Goldman Sachs in this space. So like they're custodians, like Anchorage is, you know, an amazing one. There's BitGo, there's Coinbase. So there are these large custodians or CoinList, which is a company I helped start, um, who can hold onto your crypto assets for you. But that's not really the point of crypto. The point of crypto is to be your own bank. So if the government is coming to seize money or if they're printing lots of it, you can always withdraw your crypto assets from these organizations and you can carry it yourself. You can put it on your laptop, which is kind of crazy and risky and hard. You can do it through a hardware wallet like a Ledger or a Trezor, which are pretty well-known hardware wallets where you have a small specific device that's designed just for carrying crypto. Um, but you have to understand you're replacing the banking system. You're literally replacing the government, all the guns and, and the police that back up the banking system. You're replacing all that and all the control that comes with it. So of course, it's going to require some level of sophistication. You're literally building your own Swiss bank. So it is it is quite complicated. Where to start? Well, I don't, I don't like giving people buy signals because if you're going to be a good investor, you also have to have your own conviction because then you'll know when to sell. If you call me and ask me when to buy, are you going to call me every day and say, should I sell? Should I sell? Should I sell? <laughs> right? You don't know that. It's a really, really important Right. So you have, you have to fundamentally understand it yourself. So I would say the first thing is go down the crypto rabbit hole. Listen to the interview we did with Nick Sabo. Go online and start reading up on Bitcoin, read up on Ethereum, read up on the privacy coins like Zcash and Monero. Learn about the different high-level stuff in the crypto space. Decide how much exposure that you want. Um, go buy it at a coin list or a Coinbase or, or what have you. Figure out which custodian you want to use. Um, you know, put it somewhere safe, probably in the cloud, unless you really know what you're doing. And if you if you really know what you're doing, then you can use one of the hardware wallets or one of the offline schemes. Make sure that it is protected in case that you're attacked or kidnapped or someone comes to your house or steals your computer. You know, you have to cover all those base cases. So it's not easy, but you're literally creating ev extra sovereign money. You're creating money where you know. If you ever have to flee the country, you know, like the Jews had to leave Vienna back in the 1930s, you're not like scrambling for gold. You're you're using crypto. You're not if you're living in some country where they tend to seize all the money in your bank account, then you have unseizable money. If you're worried about hyperinflation as we print too many dollars, then you have a hedge against the MMT and uh, all the various excuses that they're going to use to print money. I mean, what, probably the scariest thing that happened in 2020 from a financial perspective is both the Republican and the Democratic Party figured out that, oh, actually, we can just print lots and lots of money. And the U.S. has this reserve dollar that's reserve currency status with the dollar where most of our dollars, I think something like 70 percent, are held by foreigners because the, the trusted reserve currency of the world. They use it for trading oil. They use it for settling international transfers. They use it just to kind of hide money. They use it to protect money from their local inflationary authorities. So because of that, when we print a dollar, 70% of that inflationary effect is cost is borne by the rest of the world, not borne by us. And so the, the US government's kind of figured this out and we printed $6 trillion to fight the coronavirus. And so now both parties can agree that they can just print money to get out of any problem that they're in. A great tweet that I saw was somebody wrote that now we know what would happen if aliens were to invade the earth. The Fed would just lower interest rates. The Fed would cut interest rates, right? <laughs> um, and so unfortunately, that's just the situation we're in. So uh, they're going to keep doing that until at some point, the, you know, the rest of the world throws in the towel and says, you know, this dollar thing is not working for us. And what we rely upon is that the European euro or the Chinese renminbi and, and these other currencies are in worse situations. But that's not necessarily always true. I think there are well-managed currencies like the Swiss franc and the Singaporean dollar. There's also uh, hard assets like gold and crypto and real estate and, and even the run-up in tech stocks at some level is because equities are a tax-efficient inflation hedge or a relatively tax-efficient inflation hedge because someone like Google can just raise prices and they don't have to hire more people because they're a monopoly. You know, They can lay off half their engineers and the company will work just fine. So people are realizing this and there's a flight into hard assets to get away from inflation. And crypto is one of the few places where you can really put your money in and defend against something like the dollar reserving its reserve currency status. And these are black swans. It's very hard to talk about black swans because obviously since the dollar became the U.S. reserve currency, it hasn't lost the status. Even when we went off the gold standard, 
But at the same time, the pound sterling used to be the reserve currency of the world, and it lost its status at one point. Uh, money used to be gold back, and that went away. So it's not inconceivable that'll happen. And if it were to happen, then you would basically have the true reckoning. Then our ability to print our way out of recessions would go away. Uh, you would probably have an inflationary collapse in the U.S., and you would just see kind of our our global economic system start breaking down. In those scenarios, crypto does really well, assuming the internet stays up, <laughs> right? There are scenarios yeah. where the internet goes down too, and then all hell breaks loose, and you better have golden guns, but we're not talking about that. Um, it depends. <laughs> Cigarettes and tampons to that's, trade for your water. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, bullets are the <laughs> ultimate one, right? As we, as we also see in 2020, <laughs> would we have 5 million new gun owners in the U.S.? But it just depends how much of a prepper you are, how paranoid you want to be, and how many standard deviations out you want to you want to handle risk. But I think this is the year where a lot of people feel like risks that were inconceivable have suddenly gotten pulled in. Let me ask a dumb newbie question. As a hypothetical, so speaking as someone who, I'm a great example of someone who can use words associated with crypto who really has no fundamental understanding. I'm the I'm the guy pointing at the bird who thinks he's got it all figured out because he's able to name the yellow-throated warbler. Uh, I don't think I have it all figured out, but let's just say I managed somehow like a you know thousand monkeys typing out Shakespeare on a million laptops given infinite time. I somehow managed to get a bunch of cryptocurrency onto a hardware ledger, right? Or a, uh, a hardware wallet, rather. So I have this thing. US is going to hell in a handbasket. I somehow managed to get that to fill in the blank. Um, I'll just uh, arbitrarily choose Spain. Like I land in Spain. I'm like, oh my God, that was so close. Thank God I got out in time. I managed to make it over. How the hell do you buy an apartment or pay your rent or anything like that with crypto when it still feels like the crypto landscape and the tools are kind of computers pre graphic user interface? Do you know what I mean? Like even yeah. smart people well, can't quite figure it out. But what would you, yeah, how would you, if that were, two years in the future, I mean, I think that's unlikely, but let's just say. Uh, yeah, for most of my friends, the scenario I recommend is like, you go buy it on something like, you know, Coinbase, CoinList, whatever. Uh, you move it into a dedicated custodian, like an Anchorage uh, or a Bitco. Um, then you kind of hold it there. Now, if the shit is hitting the fan and you decide you want to get out of town, then you contact your rep there, you move it into a hardware wallet, and then you flee the country, right? Or go wherever you're mm -hmm. going. And when you land on the other side, now you have this crypto in your hardware wallet. In theory, you can log into a local crypto exchange, you know, go through their verification processes and upload it. Now you've got Bitcoin that can be traded for cash. Um, mm -hmm. Or you can go find any of the local Bitcoin meetup people and groups, the enthusiasts, the so-called maximalists, the diehard believers and the holders, and you can trade any of them Bitcoin for cash. Now, in the distant future, it's possible that people will just take Bitcoin directly because it is a you know, fungible, high quality, hard asset that can be transported and held like cash. But if you can't do that, you can always find either a local believer or you can find a crypto exchange where you can convert it. The, the thing that makes Bitcoin so interesting is not that it's necessarily the best technology. It is definitely robust and it's the OG. What makes it really interesting is it has the most diehard believers. And because it has the most diehard believers, as long as there's 5,000 or 50,000 wealthy brilliant people who just that wealthy it. part is really important yeah that they, wealthy part right. they will always trade it for you for uh, trade it with you for hard assets uh, you know uh, i think recently microstrategy started it's a company that started moving half of its treasury into bitcoin and the ceo michael saylor was quoted as saying something along the lines of i can't believe people want to sell me bitcoin <laughs> right he figured out what it was <laughs> and then he was just like i want to get as much as possible so you know, here, take pieces of my company, but give me Bitcoin. Uh, and there are, there are lots of people like him. There are lots and lots of people like him, and they exist in every major country in the world. And as long as there are believers, because it's as much a movement or a religion as it is a currency. And because what, what is a currency at the, at the end of the day? Money is just the bubble that never pops, right? It's just if we all agree tomorrow that if we all manage to come upon the story tomorrow that it's not the U.S. dollar, it's actually the euro that is really money, then the world will switch to the euro. Heck, if we agreed that clamshells were money, the, the world would switch to clamshells. Now, obviously, there are underlying characteristics that make euros and dollars better than clamshells, and so therefore we converge upon those. But if the world were to decide that Bitcoin is better money than U.S. dollars, the world would switch to Bitcoin. It's a story. It's a consensus belief. And the beauty of Bitcoin is that there are 
are these diehard maximalists and I fight with them on the internet all the time. They don't like me, by the way. So I've had Twitter battles with them running, <laughs> but I still really appreciate that they exist because they are actually the core of what makes Bitcoin always tradable, always valuable. There's always some guy in some location somewhere in the world who will give you his house for Bitcoin. And as long as that is true, and I don't see why it would stop being true, because if anything, more and more people are being added to that list every day, it has real value and it has redeemable value. What do you think the conceivable near term looks like with the possible entrance of more institutional investors? Uh, in other words, if we see, well, let me ask a better question. It was very noteworthy and newsworthy when Paul Tudor Jones uh, wrote his memo detailing why he was investing, I think it was something like 100 million, into Bitcoin or Bitcoin-like equivalents, some type of crypto equivalent, uh, if not crypto itself. Do you anticipate that more institutionals are going to come in, sovereign wealth funds, things like that? And how do you think the, the story and the landscape could change over the next handful of years? I think it's inevitable. Look, Bitcoin and crypto still have risks, right? A lot of these algorithms and schemes are new. Even Bitcoin through its proof of work mechanism, you could argue that it tends towards centralization because it gets managed by these anonymous miners and data centers and data centers of economies of scale. And so it will end up being more centralized than people would like. Um, there are up and coming competitors like Ethereum, there's privacy issues, you know, on the Bitcoin blockchain, you can be tracked forever. So it's not perfect. Um, you know, people talk about quantum computing breaking it I, I don't think that's true i think you can upgrade the encryption algorithm you know just as well or better but there are always potential problems right which are not completely resolved but every time we face one of these reckonings and that problem gets resolved the value goes up the story becomes stronger and so the same way when paul tudor jones or microstrategy buy bitcoin the story is becoming stronger the set of believers is increasing the validation is increasing and now more people can come in and hang their hat on this and say okay if Paul Tudor Jones agrees and Michael Saylor agrees, then I agree to be in that set of people who believe that this is going to be the new way to store value and wealth. And so now I'm joining their wealth storage scheme. And the early people then get rewarded for it. So one way to think about Bitcoin in particular is, or, or even actually any of the cryptocurrencies, is it's a Swiss bank account. But it's a Swiss bank account with finite space. And if you want shelf space in that Swiss bank account with finite space, you have to buy out one of the existing holders in that space. So imagine a Swiss bank account that's impregnable. It's a new one. No government can break into it. It's secured by consensus across millions of people using massive computation power around the globe. And if you want one of those safety deposit box, you got to buy it from someone who's already there. So as long as the demand for new people trying to get in the Swiss bank account is greater than the supply of people who are trying to get out of that Swiss bank account, then you're going to have to pay more for that box. And that's where the speculative power of it comes from. And I think it's going to take a good crisis to really see what crypto is worth. And actually, so far, it's been weird because... Yeah, the people, people have said that crypto failed the crisis test with COVID, right? I mean, it, it did and it didn't. What it didn't do was it didn't skyrocket, right? It didn't like go, you know, Bitcoin didn't go to 100K as everybody fled the US dollar. Um, but that kind of shows you how resilient the dollar is and how far we are from losing global reserve currency status. But at the same time, it didn't collapse either. You know, it didn't go down. It went down briefly as people needed cash to meet various margin calls and loans, but overall it stayed very stable. And I would say the number of people who have gotten involved in crypto recently as a true wealth protection mechanism is the largest I've ever seen. So I do think that a, the holder base has gone up. I don't know if we're going to see like real, you know, $3,000 Bitcoin ever again in my lifetime. We might see zero if something breaks completely, but I don't think we're going to see like a, you know, a bunch of people leaving and losing faith in it. And that's why it goes to 3k bitcoin tends to hit these highs then crash back down to a plateau hang out in a plateau for a while and then go back to a new high and i kind of feel like we're you know around the 10k level who knows i don't want to make price predictions but you know i feel like there's a stronger base of holders now than there has ever been so each one of these people comes and validates it you know paul tudor jones validates it for other hedge fund managers hedge fund managers validated for sovereign wealth funds sovereign wealth funds uh you know will validate it for central banks uh eventually some country out there is going to say actually we inflated our currency 
currency too much. Our currency collapsed. Nobody trusts us anymore. We have to adopt a new national currency. Instead of pegging to the dollar, let's peg to Bitcoin. Or let's use Bitcoin. Or let's use some other cryptocurrency. Or let's be clever and buy up a bunch of Bitcoin and then announce we're going to use Bitcoin. And then Bitcoin will skyrocket and we're all rich, right? So I think there are other scenarios where it ends up being a lot more valuable. But it's going to be stumbling steps forward and backward. It's not going to be like necessarily you know, in one fell swoop until it is, right? That's the nature of black swans. You can't predict them. And when it happens, it happens suddenly. Like I, I had a friend who used to tell me, he's now a hardcore Bitcoin. It's funny. He actually helped write a book on Bitcoin now. But when I first talked to him about Bitcoin years and years ago, he said, what's the big deal? He's like, if I ever have to flee the country, you know, I'll just buy Bitcoin then. And I said, yeah, when you have to flee the country, your entire fortune is going to buy you one Bitcoin, <laughs> right? That's the problem. It's scarce. <laughs> it's supply and demand. So you can't, it's, so it's a, like anything else, a store of value. It's a hedge. You can't wait till the last second. And I do think more and more smart people are coming into it every, every single day. And I think the psychological dynamics of crypto volatility are a lot like a casino slot machine, right? This this variable reward with high variability where you just see things spiking and dropping and then they stay flat and then they spike and they drop in a way that is unlike most equities that you or I would buy on the but public yeah, market. Even, even right? Wall Street at some level is just a big casino with a potential positive expected value and creating some value for society in terms of hedging and liquidity for companies raising money yeah. and so on. Uh, and crypto is doing the same thing. It's it's a global 24-7, 365 casino where anybody in the world can play, but through decentralized finance underneath, you're actually making loans, you're protecting wealth, you're storing it, you're letting people you know buy derivatives, you're letting people hedge. Um, so all of these things are coming up like we now have insurance in the crypto markets. We now have lending in the crypto markets. We have shorting in the crypto markets. Uh, you know, we have computation going on that requires crypto underneath. Uh, look, if com if two computers are talking to each other, if two mini AIs are talking to each other in high speed, uh, exchanging resources to run a company, how are they going to exchange money? You think they're going to send US dollars through PayPal or through Fedwire? Hell no. They're going to use crypto. Crypto is going to is the native currency of the internet. Of of course, the internet is going to have its own currency. You know, otherwise, like saying, like the internet's going to use email through the USPS, you know, US Postal Service. Heck no, <laughs> it's going to have its own native on-chain, on-wire protocol for communicating data. And so, what cryptocurrencies really are? Bitcoin isn't a thing. Bitcoin is not like there's a coin sitting somewhere. Bitcoin is an entry in a ledger. What? Yeah, exactly. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's an entry, yeah. <laughs> it's an entry in a virtual ledger, and that virtual ledger is maintained by tons of machines running across the world. And what you're doing is you're communicating value securely across the internet with no third parties in the middle validating that that is the correct communication. It's done by the entire network at once. And you're communicating and transmitting scarcity and value to the internet. And that's a new thing. What the internet gave us before was digital abundance. I can make copies of everything. And that was a very big idea. I can make one podcast and ship it to everybody. I can make one web page and ship it to everybody. That was a very big idea and created huge fortunes and huge revolutions. The same way digital scarcity is an equally interesting idea, which is I can only have one of this thing. If Naval has a Bitcoin, then Tim Ferriss doesn't have that Bitcoin or vice versa. That ability to create scarcity and transmit scarcity and value through the internet is just as important as the ability to create abundance and transmit that through the internet. And so the native language of the internet in communications and protocols around valuable things and around finance is going to be in cryptocurrencies. It's not going to be any other, any other way.